Hello and welcome to episode 139 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, an indoor weed experiment is a big success. A new crop is harvested six times a year. Wish my hair did that. Heat pumps are now mandatory in new homes in Washington state. Also mandatory, cheering for the Seattle Kraken. Electric truck stops will need more power than a small town. But about the same amount of meth. LaGuardia Airport will host a pilot project that uses a flywheel to speed up EV charging. This partnership makes perfect sense because if there's one thing LaGuardia is known for, it's speed. All that and more on this week's edition of the Clean Energy Show. Welcome everyone to what I think is the best podcast on the internet everywhere. That's a bold it's statement. It's objectively true. Objectively true. I, th I think so. Right now, this is a particular moment. And also on this week's show, Brian, we also have stuff about SpaceX. It's buying ads on Twitter because uh, its CEO bought Twitter. And, you know, we wonder if Tesla could be next because Tesla has never advertised neither SpaceX. So maybe this is the, this could break ground for that. We'll see. The first case of battery espionage, espionage. The first case of battery espionage has been discovered in Canada. Hydrogen pump prices are coming down 33% in California. I know they're going up. Hydrogen pump prices are going up 33% in California. Half the world's fossil fuel assets could become worthless by 2036. So keep that in mind when investing today. How are you? I'm good. So just an update on my house. So I applied for the Greener Homes Grant here in Canada to do energy upgrades to my house. All right. Hoping to put in an air source heat pump, get rid of my uh, natural gas. And so the first step of that is the blower door test and kind of home energy evaluation. And that all happened today. So that was fun. You know, they put the big blower in the door. They test the air tightness of the house. So they got this door-shaped uh, mask that goes all over the door with a hole for the blower and the blower only, right? As I recall. Yeah. Yeah, and it blows air in or out. I can't remember. I think but it's in. The, in. And uh, yeah, they it's test in. the air it's tightness. In. And then they can also go around the house, you know, with the sort of infrared camera thing and with the with the blower on, kind of show you where the leaks are in the house. It's wintertime now. It's super cold oh, out. Oh, well, then it'll be so sucking fairly... it. It'll be sucking it and the air will be coming in through the window cracks and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So did they go around with a smoker? No smoker, just this uh, infrared thing. Uh, maybe they use the smoker more in the summer. Oh, okay. Well, that, no, I, they didn't use a smoker on mine, and they didn't do that on mine. They didn't go around. So what did you find out? Well, not too much yet. They have to sort of crunch all the numbers because they do a volumetric assessment of the house where they calculate the interior volume of the house. So then they have to go and take the measurements that they got from the blower door do some calculations to figure it out and you get kind of like a you know an energy star rating for your home and we did this about 10 years ago when we did some upgrades it was a similar program so you know they give you a number i think it's out of 100 of what your energy efficiency is and then as you make improvements you hope to they do the blower door test again when you're all done and you hope to increase the uh but this is sort of energy star rating of your house this is mostly for air sealing right sealing how, how well your house is sealed. And yeah. Yeah, this is for, but yeah. But you, like you won't know anything and... important unless you know where it's leaking, right? Yeah. And, you know, we could see that a little bit with the infrared camera. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, we will hopefully do some more upgrades. It's the main thing we want to do is the air source heat pump. And, you know, we should get the grant for that kind of regardless of, you know, what the blower yeah, the result absolutely. is. Yeah. It's just a matter of uh, why do they even do it? Because they used to, you had to increase things by a certain percent before, but now they give it to you anyway. So what's the point of even doing it aside from maybe just guiding you, I guess, to where I, I mean, it's, it's good to know, I guess. I don't know. And I, I told you last week, there's a TV series shooting across the street from me. And they were actually outdoors shooting today. So I was worried the blower would, you know, they'd, they'd come knock on our door. Ah, and tell us that to would turn be bad. Because it was Because you're a film prof. You know their... the film community. Old man yeah. Stockton's <laughs> wanting money to shut down his blower so we could continue our production. Because yeah. people do but, that on the streets. They'll run their muscle cars and have to get paid off. Yeah. 
to get paid off to shut it down because the film crew needs quiet. But, um, and you know, I watched uh, The Godfather yesterday. Yeah. Which I hadn't seen in many, many years. Let me guess, Blu ray 4K. Exactly. It's this restored version. It's, it's quite cool. They did extensive restoration. But uh, a lot of that movie is ADR. I sort of didn't remember that. But ADR being dialogue replacement, where a lot of the dialogue was replaced in post-production. Like a lot of it. Like way more than half, I think. Wow. So it was uh, a low-production, which... low-budget film, more or less, wasn't it? Yeah, I guess that would be the reason. Like lots of location shooting and lots of extraneous noises. But um, yeah, that was sort of the surprise on that one for me. Did you just notice it more this time or, or what? Yeah, I haven't seen it in 20, 30 years. So. Oh, interesting. And it really... You were just a child then, really. I mean, you were naive and exactly. young. You accepted everything as reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I was that. But it, it's a fascinating, if you're, if you're interested in it, on the Blu-ray, and like there's these special features about how they had to restore it, because the film when it came out in 72 was just wildly more popular than anybody expected. And whenever that happens, they have to run more prints. Of the, they got to make more prints of the film. So the original negative, even though it's only 50 years old, like ended up getting totally ruined. And Ooh. the the restoration that they had to do was like amazing, like amazing, like to the point where they were going and taking outtakes, like they, they were taking outtakes and cutting them back into the film because certain shots were damaged. And, you know, with the approval of the director, you know, you can do that kind of weird thing. Oh, wow. That's kind of um i don't know how i feel about that <laughs> you know you get to used to a film that would stand out to you it, it shouldn't be in any way that you notice it's like literally like just a shot of somebody walking down oh. a hallway or oh okay you know that's different and yeah 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 it's nothing nothing important then i suppose if it's mostly adr you could just use the same adr <laughs> over the same speaking you know you could make it work yeah. nowadays i imagine yeah yeah or you know trim it if you had to I sure guess. Uh, I, uh, you know, my childhood home has been destroyed. Uh, there was an explosion what? in Regina. That was your childhood home? No, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't. But it was built next to my childhood home. And when wow. I say childhood home, I mean, I lived there for th three months in grade eight. Okay. <laughs> so my brother lived there and I left home in grade eight and, uh, went and lived with him and found out he had a girlfriend who became his wife, who eventually became his ex-wife. And, um, that building, which is a brick three-story apartment building with i think you know 12 suites and it was has to be <laughs> demolished now because, because the it, house next door blew well, up well it was it was kind of like an apartment building that they were building right when i was living there i think and it's it's like a four suite housing but nobody was living there but the whole thing blew up right off the wow. ground boom and the only person who was injured was somebody who, who didn't live there who lived somewhere um you know, that uh, window broke. But this is a story, kids. Uh, it, natural gas caused this explosion. Solar and wind have never caused an explosion. No, and I think we've had this problem in our city before. Our city is built on a clay-type soil, so it, it expands and contracts a lot. So houses move around a lot, and the soil moves around a lot. So these buried natural gas lines, I assume this is what happened, is that there was some sort of a break, the house filled up with gas and then exploded, oh, because okay. similar things have happened around here. They have, and no one's lived there for some reason for 18 months, even though it uh, seems to be a modern house. You know, I had my first uh, clean energy show dream the other night, and it was a pair of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the first one, Brian, uh, I was in the backseat of your Tesla, you yep. got out, and I was concerned, did he hit the brake? You got in front of the car and the car ran over you. <laughs> and I think I was watching Breaking Bad because I'm just now watching Breaking Bad. And yeah. there was a scene of a car running over somebody. So the same crunch from Breaking Bad was there. And I didn't think it went well for you. <laughs> and another part of the dream, for some reason, I was in this giant mansion with all kinds of celebrities around and people. And I was ready to record my end of the podcast and we couldn't find you. It was just hmm. not to be found. So I don't know Sounds what that like means I would do. psychologically or deeping. Deeply. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about uh, something that was in our local newspaper. Uh, it's from driving.ca, and it says that uh, while traditional vehicles are the transport of choice right now, there's a guy who's big in Canada. He's like the richest guy around, whose name is uh, Frank Stronach, and he is the head of Magna um, Auto Parts. So a lot of cars, almost all cars, have parts from his company. 
So he's like this guy who supplies this company that supplies all the auto parts as a third party supplier to all the major uh, car brands. Um, but he's getting kind of old. So, you know, I, I thought this is weird what he said, because he said uh, he predicts a substantial change on the horizon in three years, fuel prices will triple. No one's saying that, but he is. Uh, in eight years, fuel will be rationed and used only for essential purposes. And this is because he's made some sort of micro mobility vehicle. It looks like a car, but it only yeah. goes e-bike speeds. Okay, so it doesn't go, you don't need a license to drive it, but it looks like a, a single person car. And they're the first people that I know of in North America to be building such of a vehicle. And I wonder if he's just gone off the deep end, but because, <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't know anything about uh, full self-driving or uh, automation or robotaxes or anything like that. He's completely out to lunch in it. But anyway, I think he thinks gas is going away. So I thought that was kind of odd. Um so, you yeah. know, like I said earlier, SpaceX, as I guess, has bought a package to advertise its Starlink internet service on Twitter. Now, SpaceX has never advertised before. Starlink has never advertised before. Uh, Tesla famously does not advertise because its CEO has always said that the car sells itself until this point. It continues to do so. Um, but I wonder, Brian, I wonder if, you know, either the prop up the company he bought or could this be the first time that... Tesla actually buys advertising on Twitter. Could that happen one of these days? Well, the explanation I heard was that he wanted to test the efficacy of advertising on Twitter. So they also bought ads on like Facebook and Instagram at the same time to kind of see how the Twitter kind of advertising scheme works. But it is a sort of demand lever that Tesla could employ. Like if they ever, like they still have a big backlog of orders. So they, you know, demand is super strong. But if demand ever starts to slip, once they start producing more and more vehicles, uh, they could start advertising to, you know, if the, if the demand ever does start to slip. I guess the first thing they would probably do is um, lower prices because they've been raising yeah. prices. So because the demand has been too high. Uh, so yep. the first thing they would do is back off on those price increases and it maybe go even a bit further if they had to. I imagine they're going to. I mean, they've got three factories around the world which are going to hit their stride pretty soon, right? Or is it more than three? Yeah. Am I counting wrong? I guess technically four, if you count Fremont. Four, yeah. Yeah. And there was so, a, an Arrhenius, what, what people think is an Arrhenius report, that Tesla was going to sell its Chinese-made cars in the United States, some of them. Uh, I've long predicted that ever since I saw, uh, what's his name, uh, the uh, automotive uh, consultant guy on YouTube with... Um, Sandy Monroe. Sandy Monroe Live, his channel. Yeah, he said that uh, from what he understood, and he, he has expertise in Chinese manufacturing and, and has consulted with automakers over there, that 20% less is what a, a Tesla can make in China. Like they'll save 20% mm -hmm. on the price of the car. And it turns out that the Chinese manufacturing is really good because they're bringing the Chinese manufacturing people over to the States to say, why can't we be as productive as you? Mm -hmm. Did you ever see that uh, that documentary called what was it called? It was the, I don't know. It was the factory? It was produced by Obama, and it was mm, about no. Chinese companies that decided to take advantage of tax breaks in uh, Ohio or somewhere. Some you know to bring back a, an automotive factory or a factory that was in an automotive town in I want to say Ohio, somewhere like that, and they just could not get the productivity. <laughs> They couldn't understand it, but they couldn't, no matter what they did, they went, they finally threw in the towel, I think, and went home. And they they visited the factory in China, and man, what a different culture. What a different work culture. Like, yeah. everything is like calisthenics and unanimity and one team, and it's, uh, I don't like that. I wouldn't want to work there. But mm -hmm. as a manufacturer, it's, uh, it seems like quite an advantage, and it seems to be effective. Yeah, well, the Tesla Shanghai factory is now operating at a run rate of about a million vehicles a year. So it is likely the largest car factory in the world. And they've gotten there in pretty short time. It's only been a couple of years that they've been producing cars. So, yeah, and it's true that demand in China is down a little bit. And they did cut the prices in Japan a little bit, or sorry, in China a little bit to because the, the demand is uh, slipping. But, yeah, the, and... Those are, they export those cars currently to Europe 
but the Germany factory is going to start filling those orders. So those Chinese cars, if there's too many of them for the Chinese market, will have to go somewhere. Um, Makes I, I don't think it would be. I don't think it would be North America because the the Texas factory will start filling that in, but more cars to go to you know Australia or Japan or wherever. But on the other hand, Brian, you've got the Cybertruck coming and the Tesla Semi, so maybe you could take one of those lines and start spitting out you know Model Ys or something from um, you know from China, or maybe you make the X and the S, which are lower volume over there, and I don't know what you would do. Yeah, it's, it, it's more likely like the next model that, that's coming, like they'll eventually be a lower cost model. Yeah. So I assume they're planning for that in China. Or maybe like a variant of the 3 or the Y or something like that, that that's, you know, just one variant of it or something like that that eases the manufacturing. I don't know how it works, but... And they could start making more variants too, like yeah. even a long, like longer range variants as well. Sure. Or shorter, or mm -hmm. all-wheel drives, and more, you know. Yeah. So uh, from Bloomberg, a 35-year-old Hydro Quebec employee who worked on battery materials research has been charged with espionage for allegedly obtaining trade secrets for China. Um, wow. He's in Candiac, uh, Quebec. He has a Chinese. Uh, sounding name, so I don't know if he was originally from China or if he's an immigrant worker or wh what his nationality is, for sure. But he was arrested following an investigation that began in August. So, uh, you know, I'm concerned about the Chinese government. They have no shame when it comes to these <laughs> things. Like, they, they, you know, you, there's, there's some car companies in China are accused of duplicating Teslas, mm -hmm. just blatantly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, copying them and a lot, of, even down to the software. Um, but I don't know. This is the first time this happened, but it's, it seems like they'll do anything to be competitive. Um, and as we've mentioned before, so Hydro Quebec, that's the electricity utility in Quebec, the provincially owned utility, but they've done a lot of research into batteries and battery materials, and they own a lot of patents in that. So um, I guess. Whatever they own there at Hydro Quebec was valuable enough to be uh, espionaged. Yeah, and it's a highly competitive. Uh, you know, batteries are highly competitive. But if they have, who knows what hasn't been caught? You know, because it seems like there's been more and more instances of this. Uh, yeah, and of course there's um, you know computer espionage and all that sort of thing. That's that's a concern for all countries. And it seems like you know you have to put a lot of money into that. Well, Brian, it's time. It's We haven't had this segment in a long time, but it's a long time coming. Let's, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, this is why I asked Brian what he thinks about things that I don't know what to think about. So, Brian, Tesla has proposed a North American charging standard. Now, those of you who are new to the game, there is basically two charging ports in North America, CCS and uh, Tesla. Tesla has its own charging network, which is the largest and, you know, most consistent. But it's got a different connector, so that's a problem. But yeah. it's amazing how great that connector is, right? Because it's only, it's small. If you compare yeah. it side by side to the, the what everybody else is using for all the other cars, my car included, it's like a, half the size. But it is basically, it, you know, when you charge your car, you can do t DC direct fast current fast charging at public charging stations, or you can AC charge at home. But what I didn't realize until today is they only have two pins on there that does both. So that's yeah. why it's lighter and smaller. They, they figured out a way to do both. No, and the connector, it's, it's more like a quarter the size of the CCS yeah. connector. So, um, yeah, I think it'd be a fantastic idea. It's definitely the better standard of the two. So if North America were to standardize on the, the Tesla charging socket. I, I think that would be fantastic. Uh, the question is, it might be a bit too late. Uh, like Tesla could have maybe released this a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago. Five years had ago. had a better chance at this. Yeah. It's so disappointing. Um, too little, too late, because it's, it's probably not going to happen now. Probably not. But what Tesla said in their press release was that some of the, they've been talking already to the companies that make the charging networks, the chargers for the third party networks that normally are CCS. And it sounds like they have some plans already to incorporate the Tesla 
connector onto those. So, um, I don't know. There is some hope, but it's probably too late and CCS will likely, there'll likely be two standards in North America, CCS and Tesla. So some people with non-Teslas are buying a, you know, something for an adapter from Korea or somewhere and shipping it in at great, you know, expense and effort. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the Tesla to CCS adapter, which is now available in North America. Oh, it is. So, it is available. Yeah. So... I could take that connector and go to a Petro Canada station and charge my right. Tesla. Um, but my car is not currently compatible with this adapter. I see. Okay. Well, the, part of this is the federal government in the United States is giving a lot of money to expand the charging networks. And so, but when, tes you, when you do that, you have to have more than one charging standard, more than one car company that uses it. So if just yep. one car company... Any mm -hmm. car company that sells maybe 10 cars a year adopts yeah. it. Tesla's in the clear. They don't have to make the yeah. CCS ones. And they could get, yeah, all the government subsidies um, for their just making their chargers that they already make. Now, the government could go and uh, tweak that fine print. Okay, so yeah. here's another one for you. This is a Clean Technica op-ed. It says, tolling the highway to green trucking. Should tolls be implemented uh, on combustion semi-trailers once EVs are on the road. Do you think that would be an effective way to do it? Well, I, I don't think you'll have to. It's kind of like the cost of running a combustion truck will already be more expensive. So there's already a kind of a penalty just for using one. So an extra toll probably not needed. I mean, what's needed is faster production of the electric trucks and get those on the road. So yeah. that's the thing they should that's, be This is about. assuming price parity that they're, they're going to, you know, the cost of ownership is going to be the same. And we know that it's not going to be, that it's going to be maintenance and uh, energy savings, right? Right. Well, uh, charging lithium ion cells at different rates boosts the lifetime of battery packs for electric vehicles. So says a yet another Stanford study. We have so many Stanford studies on this show. According to the study, batteries managed with this new technology could handle at least 20% more charge discharge cycles, even with frequent fast charging, which puts an extra strain on the battery. So basically, they're saying don't charge each of the individual cells at the same rate all the time, and that actually gives you 20% longer life. And 20% longer life, if you're talking about a fleet of cars, of a million cars mm -hmm. that are robo-taxis, or storage for the electrical grid that lasts 12 years instead of 10, the costs on those greatly changes. Like the, with doing a, a, basically a, a, a software tweak. Mm -hmm. So that seems quite, to me, it seems like it's it's got a lot of potential if it works. Yeah, that's exciting. There's a lot that can be done with software. It, it isn't just the hardware components of a battery. Or the chemistries. Um, where, or the chemistries where you can improve the life. Yeah, it's, you know, the software can have a big, uh, big benefit. So Ford is officially the number two electric vehicle seller in the United States. Uh, and if you extrapolate out the 12 months uh, of a year based on what they had in October, Ford would achieve 75,000 EV sales, which is what's Tesla at right now? Uh, close to a million. Close to a million. So that's not much, but... That's what your number two is. I wow. mean, it's, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't have picked Ford to be number two right now. They would have picked GM or more likely Volkswagen. Volkswagen, yeah. And that points back to our previous conversations about the connectors. It like s standardizing on the Tesla connector has a fighting chance just because Tesla vehicles are so ubiquitous in uh, North America in terms of EVs. So the uh, California regulatory body that uh, tried to put, um, well, the government tried to put an 8% or an $8 tax on new rooftop solar, uh, yeah, they eliminated that. We mentioned that before in the show. I was, why? Yeah. I don't know why, but they, nice. <laughs> they did that. Another thing I wanted to talk about is uh, electric truck stops will need as much power as a small town. So as Tesla rolls out its uh, semi next month, hopefully, I think December 1st is when they're having the release. Are you looking forward to that one? Yeah, yeah. Do you think something special could roll out of the back of that truck? Um, I hadn't thought of that. The but... Tesla e-bike? The robotic right. Musk? 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a new social media platform and we'll roll out to the back of the truck. Um, yeah, so it's adding pressure on the trucking industry to go green, but grid upgrades must start now if the new era is to last. Um, yeah, this is from Bloomberg. And sometimes these stories make me wonder if that is all accurate. But a sweeping new study, this is another study of highway charging requirements conducted by utility company National Grid PLC. Researchers found that by 2030, electrifying a typical highway gas station will require as much power as a professional sports stadium. And uh, I would think sports stadiums use less now with all the LED lighting, but... It's probably better, but I know like our city built a new football stadium a few years ago. And I don't know if you noticed, but there are all kinds of like elect electrical transformer like boxes outside the stadium. Yeah. They, they hid them in the park. There's a park next yeah. to the stadium. And they had to try and hide all of these electrical transformer boxes. And there's a lot of them. And the power used to go out on the old stadium we had here. The, this is the stadium we have for the Canadian Football League, by the way. And okay, so this is just for electrified passenger vehicles as more electric trucks hit the road the projected power needs for a big truck stop by 2035 will equal that of a small town and they think that lots of uh, wiring will have to be done you know I, nobody really knows how this is going to play out with trucks like is there going to be specialized newly built truck stops because truck stops are a thing you know you have a shower you yeah you park the truck for a while um you know, it's a truck resting stop as well as, so I don't know how, how do you think that will, will play out if you had to guess? Well, there's usually a decent amount of space at existing truck stops. So I assume there's enough room at the existing truck stops to kind of transform them and, and have both fuel and electric as we, uh, you know, hopefully they have started working on that already. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, just to tag on to that, I want to skip ahead to the story about LaGuardia Airport. Sure. Because I, I think it sort of makes me think of the same issue. So um, there's a story here from Electrek about Zoo's Power um, that's got this um, machine with a flywheel. And this is being installed at LaGuardia Airport to facilitate fast charging of cars, uh, rental cars particularly. And yeah, I bring it up because the reason this machine exists is that um, the power available in certain locations is kind of, can be limited, right? Like, you know, if these truck stops are going to need all the power of a small town, well, you don't necessarily have the grid infrastructure where you need it. So um, I don't think this does an enormous amount, like it's not going to triple or quadruple the amount of power available. But the idea behind this Zoo's flywheel machine is that it literally uses flywheels. And we talked about this before. Some power plants use flywheels as well. It's literally just the momentum of a spinning wheel to help kind of even the power output of your, you know, hydroelectric dam or whatever. Um, anyway, so I guess the idea being that you take a limited amount of power that might be available in a parking lot at an airport and then you use this flywheel machine and some by spinning up the flywheels, you can increase the amount of power available. It's sort of similar to having batteries on site. Um, I would think that's going to be the more normal solution, like at these truck stops would be to put a big, you know, battery pack, a grid storage battery pack at, um, at a truck stop. But this is a kind of a smaller and cheaper way to like add just a bit more power to like what's available for your fast chargers. So with Hertz ordering a couple hundred thousand electric vehicles from Tesla and GM, I wonder how the infrastructure at, at airports is going to go. I mean, is that, nobody's panicking about that. With batteries, you would have um, the chance and the load demand, because most flights happen, you know, 6 a.m. to midnight or whatever. You could have six yeah. hours to, um, you know, when people aren't taking those cars, maybe to charge up the batteries for the next day and that yeah. would... Uh, yeah, I think I can I can see that being an important thing unless they have some off-site, like just off the airport uh, type of, um, you know, parking spaces for, for charging. Yeah, and like our parking spaces here in Canada at our airports, like a lot of them are probably already 
electrified where we live because it's uh, super cold in the winter and so you have plug-ins for block heaters. So at least there's power running to these parking lots, whereas, of course, in many places there would be no power running there at all. Yeah. So, um, you know, as things charge faster, as the technology improves for electric cars, that becomes less of a problem, but you need higher demands for, you know, if everybody starts charging at the same time and they take more power, then I don't know. So, I mean, you can limit it. You can always limit it. You, if you're a fleet of vehicles like rental cars, you can tell it whatever you want to um, to have for, for um, output at any given time. Mm -hmm. Half the world's fossil fuel assets could become worthless by 2036 in a net zero transition. So says an article in The Guardian that I read, uh, $11 trillion in fossil fuel asset crash could cause a 2008 financial crisis, warns a new study. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. That's my hot take. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. No, it's something I really wonder about and think about. Like, obviously, these assets are going to become stranded and worthless at some point, or at least, you know, the values start crashing at some point. But at, you know, what point does that start to happen? Is it two years from now? Is it six years from now? Is it 20 years from now? Um, it's hard to say, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be holding a lot of fossil fuel investments longer than the next uh, couple of years. That's I think sure. the, the big question is, when will EVs really take off where there's not a battery constraint and, or, you know, chips or other things that are from yeah. the, um, the pandemic problem? But... Uh, it sure seems like it's going to be within five years. It could be two years. It could be five years. But somewhere in that period, I think it's really going to grab momentum. And yeah. yeah, but also too, like as we've discussed, like last week and other weeks, you know, there's not a lot of new money being spent on new oil exploration because they can kind of foresee, okay, there's not really going to be the demand. It's not worth it to spend this money building. So that does mean that. Um, you know, the supply of oil will be kind of naturally constrained if the system doesn't expand. So it could be that as the, you know, oil industry shrinks, the production shrinks. And if the production shrinks enough, then the price stays up. So countries that are slow to decarbonize will suffer, but early movers will profit. This is something we say on the show all the time. You know, you have to move now. And uh, yeah. our jurisdiction is not great where we live. We live in fossil fuel country with a mentality thereof. And our country as a whole is starting to make some moves. But, you know, it, 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 we're basically a fossil fuel country in Canada and even the United States to, to some extent. But it, it finds that uh, renewables that are freed up uh, investment will more than make up for the losses of the global economy. So, yeah, so you're, you're freeing up a whole whack of investment that was going into fossil fuels that can go into other things and expand the economy that way. And, you know, just the renewables themselves will save money, of course. So it highlights the risk of producing far more oil and gas than required for future demand, which is estimated to leave 11 trillion to 14 trillion in stranded assets, which is a lot of stranded assets, Brian. And uh, yeah. also... As we always say, we predict that governments are going to have to, and therefore you and I are going to have to pay for the cleanup of some of these wells as well. So the most vulnerable yeah. assets are those in remote regions or technically challenging environments. Most exposed are Canadian tar sands uh, in northern Alberta. U.S. shale, which I believe we have shale around here, don't we? Probably. I don't know. Maybe not as much. Dakota? Maybe not as much. Uh, we No, we do. I think we do. Some of it's you know, it's pricier here than it is other places. So we get hit even with our non-tar sands oil. And the Russian Arctic, uh, followed by deep offshore wells in Brazil and elsewhere. And North Sea oil is also relatively expensive to extract. Um, and it's going to be hit when demand falls. So I, I'm i worried about this because it's it's mm -hmm. could affect us as being an oil part of the world. But uh, it says, in contrast... Current oil, gas, and coal importers, such as the EU, Japan, India, and South Korea, will reap hefty economic dividends from the transition because they will be able to use the money they save on spending 
you know, those places spend the gobs of money. We get our gas cheap here in North America, but they would, they're spending gobs of money on fuel purchases and they'll be able to use that money to invest uh, in their own, um, you know, in their own economies. And the lead, yeah. the lead author of the report said, in the worst case scenario, people will keep investing in fossil fuels until suddenly the man they expected does not materialize and they realize that they, what they own is worthless. And we could see a financial crisis on the scale of 2008. Uh, Houston, Detroit it could have the same fate as Detroit did, you know, when the car industry collapsed uh, earlier in this uh, century. So, yeah, it's got to be carefully managed. If you don't accept that all this is going to happen, like people around here, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to say about that. Yeah, and when your oil is expensive to extract, like it is in the Alberta oil sands, uh, that stuff will be the first to go because it won't you won't be able to sell it at a profit. So you've got yet another heat pump story. Heat pumps are the item of the year, I say. Yes, absolutely. No, it's it's amazing how even when this podcast started a couple of years ago, um, it was barely it in our like vernacular. It was it was barely in the vernacular. Yeah. And now it's uh, it's everywhere. So yes, uh, Electrek is reporting heat pumps are now mandatory in Washington State for new homes and apartments as well uh, from July 2023 onward. Um, but the thing that I think is interesting about this, and it's not really mentioned in the story, you know, we talked about the incredible heat wave that happened last summer on the west coast of North America, so Seattle area, Vancouver area, and uh, they just an unprecedented heat wave because of climate change. And so many of those homes and places and businesses and apartments are not cooled. So this is the other benefit of this. So not only do you start um, heating your homes with electricity, but you also in Washington state now are adding essentially mandatory air conditioning um, which, especially if it's, you know, low income apartments or something would be a, a godsend yeah. for people who aren't, you know, hopefully won't, I mean, there was literally thousands of people died from, from the heat, heat stroke, um, on the West coast last summer. Well, that's an interesting take, um, uh, you know, because they don't, they're in a region that doesn't have air conditioning. And yet with climate yeah. change, we, we can see this happening a lot more often, and now they'll be prepared. That's an interesting aspect yeah. of the story, and I, I have to wonder if it was even part of the planning. No, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it depends on when they started talking about this. But you know, you know, the one of the great benefits is of, of a heat pump, heating and cooling. You get both in the same machine. So you know, why just put in an air conditioner? when you can put in an air conditioner that also runs in reverse and can uh, heat your home as well. And for people who are new to the podcast or this type of thing, heat pumps are reverse air conditioners, essentially, that transfer heat from one place to another, uh, uh, like inside the house to outside an air conditioning or outside, you know, even, even if there's a little bit of energy in that air, it takes it out. And the idea is to use electricity, which instead of natural gas, right? If you're heating, you want to use... Mm -hmm. Um, electricity. This is the most efficient way to do it. Yeah. And in a place like Washington state, a lot of homes are already heated with electricity. Like it's not a frigid cold place like here. So there are more like, you know, 99% of homes where we live are heated by natural gas because it's, it's so ridiculously cold, but in a milder climate, you might have electric baseboards in a lot of homes. So it is something like 50% already are heated with electricity in Washington state, and this will eventually get it up to a hundred percent. Yeah. That's very interesting. And, and, a, and a very interesting side effect of going green, um, and yeah. using solar and wind and, and so forth for your heating that you will actually probably save lives from a government policy in future heat waves. Who knows when those heat waves will come, but they're going to come more often, those once in a century type heat waves, or once in a thousand years or 500 years, whatever it was. Uh, I want to talk about indoor wheat, because we yeah. live in the heart of wheat country. You can't yeah. swing a cat with a hoodie, a wheat sheaf, um, or it's on yeah. symbols for everything where we live. We're the breadbasket oh, yeah. of Canada. <laughs> and yeah. uh, what was the name of your first feature film? I made a film called Wheat there Soup. There you go. It had to be in the title. <laughs> It had to be. <laughs> so uh, this is interesting to us because you know how there's hydroponics, like indoor 
gardening, which I, I'm fascinated with. They do it in containers. They do it in buildings yep. where they're basically using uh, fertilized water and no soil to grow, yep. you know, tomatoes or whatever um, in greenhouse-like conditions. And I find that very interesting, especially when they can do it up north. Um, and by the way, I saw uh, another article in Bloomberg about the Yukon, the, the climate changing, and their people are up there uh, growing potatoes and things that they never used to grow before, and wheat wow. as well, which is required yeah. you know, a lot, and cabbage and things like that that require a lot of sunlight when they have their 20-hour uh, sunlight days in June. Uh, but, you know, it costs a lot to transport fresh food up there, so it's very expensive and very not fresh. Well, the carrots is another thing that they're growing a lot of, potatoes and carrots, so that's great. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great in one sense because it's, you know, there's an advantage to them. But in this case, indoor wheat, uh, Amsterdam-based startup Infarm grew wheat without using soil or chemical pesticides, which is nice. Uh, and with far less water than conventional farming, which is also nice. So the first indoor farming company to grow a stable, cr a staple crop in as a milestone for an Asian industry that has attracted venture capital funding on its promise that its technology can help feed the planet. Uh, if delivered at scale, growing a staple crop indoors has the potential to become a game changer. Supplies have uh, increasingly been challenged by climate change and logistical issues so you could grow well you could grow you know wheat in, in antarctica if you wanted to right if you got this technology down and infarm said that its first trial shows that projected annual wheat yields of 117 tons a year no pardon me 117 tons a hectare okay now that compares with the average 2022 yields of 5.6 so let me give you that again. Indoors, 117 tons a hectare annually. Outdoors, 5.6. And in the European Union, it's 3.1. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, that's wow. in the European Union. It's actually less than the United States, which, which surprises me. It's only 3.1. Now, part of that reason of the higher yields is they have six crops a year. Okay? But if you times yeah. three... 0.1 times 6, you still don't get 117 tons. So it's just a lot more dense and efficient uh, to do it that way. I mean, it's not easy. We're, we're, we're probably mm -hmm. decades away from this being a regular thing and getting the efficiencies yeah. and the costs down, uh, you know, maybe a couple of decades. Uh, it's hard to tell, but, you know, it depends on what the, the need is, too. But this is interesting, and I, I just... Because it's going to be perfect, right? You're not going to sp spread pesticides on it. You're not going to have to worry about weeds. Yeah. It's just going to be pure indoor stuff and locally delivered. No, and the more things, of course, you can do locally, then the more transportation that you can eliminate. You know, so many things now that, you know, our produce at the grocery stores just shipped in from incredible distances uh, here. But if, you know, all that stuff could be drawn, grown locally, uh, it would just be so much more efficient and just kind of save all that energy. I mean, theoretically, you could, in the middle of a desert in Africa, start up an operation like this and make flour or make, you know, proteins for food. Yeah. Uh, basically, um, you would need water, but you wouldn't need as much of it. So if you could, you know, use solar to desalinate water. Um, you could put it anywhere. You could put it in, because, you know, the, we transport all of our grain by ship or, you know, which goes by train from the center of the continent out to the, um, the coasts and then onto ships. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the more, you, I don't think that this is going to completely replace grain farming, but it could augment it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a hundred years from now it could replace it, but you know, in the near term, this is basically saying that it could just fit in, you know, reduce the, the challenges of supply uh, and, you know, in certain situations. So now there's a lot of land will be required to produce this. Uh, wheat cultivation takes more than 216 million hectares of land, uh, more than any other crop. So, yeah, wheat takes a lot, a lot of land, which we have a lot of land here, a lot of flat land. Most of our province is filled with wheat fields. It's kind of insane. So, yeah, they would require very large indoor farms exceeding the area uh, of all the wheat in France, I think. But, you know, they said it could potentially increase its yield by another 50% in the coming years, thanks to better technology. So it could even be 200 times or 200 tons instead of three tons. Uh, so that's interesting. 
Yeah, once they learn what they're doing and tweak it and software can play a part, perhaps. Uh, yeah, it could be amazing. Uh, okay, so a uh, story here from Hydrogen Insight. And this is about hydrogen pump prices um, in California. So this was something I just had never thought about before. Now, um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles do exist. James, take a guess. How many hydrogen fuel cell vehicles do you think there are in California, which is currently one of the main markets for them? 300, 410. There's 10,000. Okay. Which is not bad. I, it's kind of more than I expected. And there's... Um, what are they? You know, a series of hydro... The, they're that? not all the Toyota Mirai. What are, what are these vehicles? There's a Toyota Mirai. There's a Hyundai that's really nice. I forget the name of it, but there's a big Hyundai SUV that's a hydrogen vehicle. They've sold a few of those for sure. Okay. But uh, yeah, so there's hydrogen fueling stations in California, not in too many other places, but... Um, I just was interested in this because, yes, recently they had to hike up the price at the pump of these hydrogen up 33% in California. This is a fairly big price jump. So um, just in terms of the price per mile, I thought this was really interesting. So right now, 30 cents a mile is basically what it costs you to drive um, a hydrogen vehicle in California, roughly. Um, but, in a gasoline vehicle, down to 22 okay, cents. Okay, California has the most expensive gasoline in North America. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's probably, no, it's probably more expensive here in Canada. Is it? Because I went there. <laughs> it was pretty damn expensive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a few years ago. Yeah. Um, so 22 cents for gas per mile and 30 cents per mile for hydrogen. And plus you yes. spend a whole bunch more money on your hydrogen car than you do a gas car. It's some serious yes. technology. With And then if you're driving an EV and you charge it off the grid, you're down to seven cents per mile. Um, if you have to use a fast charger like a Tesla supercharger, then you're up to 13 cents per mile. But that's compared to, you know, 30 cents a mile for uh, driving a hydrogen car. So I just wasn't totally clear on that until now. The actual cost of driving um, a hydrogen vehicle is, you know, more than gas, way more than electricity. Now, theoretically, if we were to super build out the hydrogen infrastructure and kind of get that all pumping, again, lo locality is a key to that. Like if, if each city had its own, you know, hydrogen plant or whatever, or you had even smaller ones at the filling stations making the hydrogen there, that would reduce costs a lot. Um, but, you know, for right now, it's super expensive to fill up with hydrogen, and I, I don't see that... Uh, coming down anytime soon and you know the days of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles is probably numbered if we had no other option yeah we would be going full steam ahead with hydrogen and trying to get that does it still take a while but we would, we would be yeah. trying to get green hydrogen and then we would be trying to get that green hydrogen price down so that it would be cost effective but since we have an alternative to that called battery electric yeah. vehicles, then, you know, and electricity is also expensive in California. So if you compare this to other places, uh, yeah. it would be even a larger, uh, you know, variation there. And as we've said, so obviously the electricity for charging your electric car comes from the grid. And there are certain shortfalls at places, perhaps like truck stops that don't have enough grid infrastructure. So it's, it's far from perfect, but any electrical outlet anywhere in the world can charge an electric vehicle. So that's just an insane advantage over these very rare uh, hydrogen stations. Yeah, they're expensive and transportation and you know processing of hydrogen is also an issue. So Amazon is getting heat. We, we, we get heat for not talking about e-bikes sometimes. And, uh, yeah. Well, Amazon is getting heat for selling kits to override speed limits of e-bikes. Now this is mostly happening in Europe. Right, uh, because there's more restrictions in Europe. Europe has, uh, you know, strict electric bike laws that limit electric bicycles to a sluggish 25 kilometers an hour, or 15.5 miles per hour. Even an old man like me can go that. Well, I can't go 25. Actually, it takes the work to go 25. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that is kind of cool. But solutions range from an electromagnetic modifications or chipping quote-unquote, that can remove digital speed limits. So you, 
people do that with cars sometimes, to hardware mm-hmm. hacks that trick the bike's speed sensors into thinking it's going slower than it truly is. And I haven't been able to find out exactly how that works. So I'm kind of curious. Yeah, I thought maybe you had done that on your bike where you it's like you change a setting and it yeah, it messes up the speedometer so it ends up sending well, you faster than what it's you do is you, you change your this the wheel size on your bike. So this didn't work for ah, mine. It was supposed to. Uh-huh. But my bike manufacturer has been kind of savvy to all the tricks. So some by the time I get to them they've figured it out and, and have eliminated <laughs> that. But yeah, if you put in a if you have like a twenty nine inch wheel and then you tell it it's a kid's wheel of half that size, then it, right. it it thinks that that one rotation is actually going a shorter right. distance. And yeah, and then you won't have a proper speed, but I don't know. Um, and I have that Fido electric folding bike and I looked on the internet and apparently there is a hack that you can do by sort of like pressing a certain combination of buttons on the little kind of like uh, remote screen there. Um, where you can hack it to go faster, but I, I haven't tried. And with mine, it was a code. It was like an eight-digit code that you could type in at a certain place, and that yeah. one also did not work. I was curious, but I think the longevity of James is more important than the thrill of maybe trying out a a fifty <laughs> kilometer an hour. That's probably all my bike could do if it really wanted to, and it would take a while to get there yeah. too. The important thing to remember in all this is you probably don't need your bike to go any faster. No, but I, my, my, what does my bike do? My bike does 32 instead of 25. So that's the next level up. Yeah. I think that's about what mine And does, that's yeah. pretty fast. And like I've said before yeah. in the show, I get kind of uncomfortable at that yeah. speed. <laughs> and yet, you know, some other bastard on an e-bike passes me and I think, ah, I wish I had more speed. I start pedaling. <laughs> <laughs> Which you can do, apparently. You can pedal oh, yeah. <laughs> pedal and use the e-bike part. Well, anyway, it's, uh, I guess, e-bike hot rodding, as it's called, is much less common in the United States where e-bikes are permitted to go up to 45 kilometers an hour. That's the United States. You can have guns and fast e-bikes or whatever you want. Tanks. Yep. Yep. Cruise missiles. No. And modifying your car, uh, you know take out the pollution controls, although they have been cracking down on that. uh, Oh, it's time for the Tweet of the Week. Ah, this is where we pick a tweet. And uh, and this last week was from Tony Siba. It's going to be from Tony Siba again. Okay, I'm sorry. Tony Siba is kind of one of our um, main people that we follow on the show here. Now, this was a person who was responding to uh, how 5 million... What Tony calls precision fermentation. This is the future of food, he believes, that will be disruptive based on price. This is um, one of the ways that, you know, is like beyond meat. That's one aspect. And then there's cellular meat, which will actually resemble steak and the texture of steak in the future, maybe 10 years from now, that'll be viable uh, financially. But dairy is the first one that's going to be disrupted because... Uh, a glass of milk is 90% water and 3% of that is protein from the milk. So that's really all yep. you're dealing with is that protein because the rest is fat and sugars, which you can get from other places. It doesn't have to be from a cow. So uh, as they, you know, make these things in like brewery-like buildings and disrupt um, milk, he says there's 5 million dairy cows in New Zealand. And so that would require 100 precision fermentation factories to replace all the cows, uh, less if they're bigger, which they will be. So it's just a matter of time and probably less time than most people expect. And Tony Siba says to that tweet, correct, the total land needed to replace all the cows in New Zealand, 5 million of them, which is more than Canada, by the way. I believe we only have a million cows in Canada. Um, wow. I haven't counted lately, but I'm told that it's around a million. The total land needed would be around 1,700 acres. Um But you compare that with, like, uh, the Auckland Airport, it's 3,700 acres. So basically half the Auckland Airport could replace all the dairy cows. Yeah. The land-wise. And then you have all that land you could put solar on and do other things. Like, it's this is a huge disruption of the world. Yeah, if, if you think of a cow as basically a type of food technology, uh, well, it can be delicious. It's the least efficient food technology uh, in fact i think tony said that the cow yeah. in particular is the least efficient of all of the kind of uh, animal food technologies so 
you know, we get a lot of things from a cow, but the resources and the land and, and everything needed to get that is uh, kind of insane and is ripe for disruption. So as Tony points out, the first disruption will happen in just a few years, and he thinks that dairy will be bankrupt by 2030. And the reason is that dairy... 30% of his business is business to business. So if you buy a protein mm -hmm. shake, you're buying protein powder, okay? And if it's cheaper mm -hmm. to come from this fake stuff, if you can call it that, yeah. fermentation, than it is from a real dairy cow, and you're greener, um, the people are just going to go where the cheapest. You know, if you buy bulk for a protein bar or a protein shake or whatever, mm -hmm. all these things that have uh, chocolate bars and everything... Um, and all kinds of foods that are processed will have, you know, first that will go and then 30% of dairy's gone. Yeah, no, and he mentioned too in his latest video, just the switch, like Coke and Pepsi switched from cane sugar to uh, corn sugar back in the 80s. Basically, their entire product lines switching over to corn as the source for sugar. And while there is probably some taste difference, they was definitely not enough taste difference to stop what they were doing because they completely... Four years. You know, the main ingredient... Four years they did it. In, and just boom. Yeah. In four years, complete switchover. And this is the main ingredient uh, in their product. Yes. And that means it's time for the lightning round. A quick look at fast-paced energy news and climate news from this past week. Growing EV demand helps Volkswagen reach half a million ID deliveries one year early, Brian. That is a good news story, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, we talked about that a few weeks ago. They're on track for 500,000 deliveries. That's Volkswagen uh, this year of EVs, and uh, that's a huge, huge number. Volvo debuts its first electric trucks made with fossil-free steel. That is yeah. steel made with green electricity, and it is also 90% recyclable. So that's cool. Yeah, so Volvo is trying to green their whole lineup of vehicles, and they're doing it partly by switching over to electric, but they're also doing it by going with fossil-free steel um, in their cars, which increasingly more and more uh, manufacturers are going to do. COP27 News, 41 signatories have joined the pledge to stop funding fossil fuels by the end of year, but problematically, Brian, four large signatories are not signing. Germany, Italy, the United States, and your favorite country in the world, Canada. No. I'm sorry. Damn it. <laughs> That's just sad. <laughs> Can't overuse that, can I? <laughs> okay, it's time for a CS Fast Facts. Toyota has sold 4.7 million Priuses to date. That's no easy feat. Toyota just passed the 3 million mark for common of production of all of its vehicle models. No, Tesla. Tesla, pardon me. Tesla did 3 million, but totally. uh, that's to date over the last 10 plus years. 4.7 yep. million Priuses are on the road, but nobody buys them anymore. No, that you did you see the stat of like they're only they at one time they were selling 500,000 Priuses a year and it's down to 86,000 yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's because nobody you know people who bought them initially wanted an environmentally friendly car or to save money. Yeah, the best way to be environmentally friendly or to save money is to buy electric now, um, or at least you know electric hybrid. But anyway, solar power already saved China, India, Japan, South Korea. Vietnam, the Philippines, and Thailand, $34 billion American in potential fossil fuel costs when in the first half of this year, first half of 2022, $34 billion saved in fossil fuel costs. We're just getting started. That's uh, astonishing. Yeah, I mean, it. it uh, spend your money on solar and then you won't have to spend it on fossil fuel. The U.S. will finance about a third of the $9 billion room $9, million, $9 billion Romania needs. They're getting it from the United States, which seems like a bad investment. Uh, 2021 has seen record high sales for heat pumps. I thought I would mention this. Globally, yeah. up 13%. Okay, that's everywhere in the world. 
Europe is up 35%. I wonder why, Vladimir. <laughs> the U.S. is up 15% and China 13%. So this heat pump thing is starting to, yeah. You know, and if, whoever makes the most and the best heat pumps, put your money in them because they're going to they're gonna pay back. No, and I assume that um, I haven't seen announcements, but I assume that there are heat pump factories being built as we speak. And I'll, I don't know, I'll, we always hear battery factory announcements yeah. and things like that. I, I don't hear heat pump factory announcements, but presumably uh, it's going and on because the demand is... Biden's huge. Inflation Reduction Act had money for developing better heat pumps too. So there's going to yeah. be some R&D in there. Uh, friend of the show, Greta Thunberg, Thunberg rather... I'm kidding. She's not a friend of the show, but we're working on it slowly. <laughs> a global witness found that more than 600 people are at the talks in Egypt at COP27. They're linked to fossil fuels. 600 people there are linked to fossil fuels. And Brian, that is more than the combined delegations from the 10 most climate impacted countries. Barf. You know, we're, we're at a, a critical stage now where we got to say no to fossil fuels. Just say no. And we gotta we, we gotta stop the greenwashing. We gotta stop the BS right now. Right now, no, no time right left. From Tennessee Valley Authority, that is the uh, one of the grids in the southern U.S. The three giant cooling towers at the retired Paradise Coal Plant in Kentucky came down this morning. Well, it was a few mornings ago now, as demolition efforts continued at the site. And they say we are striving for a cleaner and more efficient energy future as we are building the energy system of the future. And by God, Brian, we have a clip. Fantastic. There's the initial charge. The towers are collapsing. They're coming down completely now. And they're gone. Another one bites the dust. <laughs> Goodbye coal plants. Three cooling towers in Kentucky. A grave risk of winter blackouts, speaking of nuclear, is happening in France because electric electricity prices have surged past $1,000, or pardon me, 1,000 euros per megawatt hour as more nuclear reactors, more, are closing in France. As if enough hadn't closed already. Uh, what this means, yeah. Brian, is on a, well, they, a, a cold January day, France needs around 45 gigawatts of nuclear energy. And one day last week, there was only 25 available. Yeah, and there was a lot of reactors down, or at least down partially, for repairs. So um, the amount of electricity from nuclear in France dropped uh, 34% year over year um, in October. Just less power available from nuclear, which everyone always says is like reliable baseload power. That's one of the reasons it's promoted. Well, it's not, reliable. Reasons it's not reliable here. It, it's, but it's not exactly that. You know, it's the, um, the pipes, the cooling pipes that are structurally problematic and cracked and, and they realize that they're all bad. So they have this, and it apparently takes a while. It's not, they've hired like a hundred contractors to go in and fix this, but it, it's not that easy. Finally this week, Brian, Japan's government wants to remotely control private air conditioners to avoid power outages. The Japan Time points out that the government committee is currently working under the concept that the government would only be able to turn down AC units if individual owners have agreed in advance to grant them that authority. This is something we've seen about the third time now on the show. Yeah, and in Ontario, they're working on this here in Canada where remote control... Uh, California, they do it with text messages where they just tell everybody yeah. to, to turn, uh, you know, stop using so much AC. But this works and no one really suffers if you shave a degree or two off your air conditioning for an hour and save the, it's much better than a blackout where you have no air conditioning. So yeah. that's not so bad. That is our show for this week. Next week, uh, I'll be talking about the new Toyota Prius lineup that will be announced between now and then. And uh, what excitement that'll be, because I need a car badly, Brian. Mine's starting to fall apart. My Prius yeah. is getting long in the tooth. How disappointed will I be? Tune in to find out. Maybe I should sell you my car. My, would you buy my Tesla? Um, well, I would. <laughs> the, the, go, the, the, the street price for that Tesla, unless there's a murder in okay. it, is not going to be good for me. So, 
Well, what if I gave you a really good deal? Uh, I'll take two. <laughs> Why would you want to I throw mean, it's away not money? Really the, it's not the form factor you want, I guess, but. I don't care. I would take a Tesla. What What would you do for a new car? Buy a Y? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, what kind of, you thinking about it? Starting to, starting to, possibly, uh, possibly. Well, that's interesting. Uh, what are your interest rates? <laughs> <laughs> And and how quickly yeah, do you I'll break s- legs? <laughs> we'll, we'll sign over, uh, like make it a twenty year loan. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty much what it would have to be, I think. Anyway, everyone out there, we thank you for listening. We do appreciate you, and we'd love to hear from you. So contact us with anything that's on your mind. Clean Energy Show at Gmail dot com. We are on uh, social media with the handle Clean Energy Pod. Uh, we're on TikTok. Check out our TikTok channel. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel, too, because, you know, why not? Sometimes you might want to look at things that are shiny. And you can even leave us a voicemail where we get to hear your voice, which is always a thrill for us. Speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. Remember, subscribe if you're new to the podcast so that you can get new episodes delivered every week. And, Brian, I look forward to next week. Yeah, see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.